Hello and welcome to A Wee Bit of War, a podcast dedicated to telling stories of Northern Ireland during the Second World War. I'm your host, Scott Edgar, and in this episode, we're preluding next week's Canada Day celebrations in Belfast by looking at the connections between Ulster and Canada and one of Northern Ireland's least known wartime stories. I'm going to take you back in time, not quite as far back in time as we usually go on a wee bit of war, but back to the year 2000. The world had not yet imploded as a result of the Y2K bug. Talk is a miracle by Fragma and Derude Sandstorm were the sounds of the summer and I was 18 years old. A brand new venue had been built on Queen's Island in East Belfast. And high above that venue was a gantry, a walkway, a construction of polished steel with a huge drop beneath that would terrify me today, but not then. From there, I looked down on what was then the Odyssey Arena. The floor below would, over the years, see use as a conference centre, a gig venue, a motocross arena, and more excitingly for me, an ice hockey rink. On the 2nd of December 2000, the Belfast Giants took to the ice in the Odyssey Arena, and they suffered a 2-1 defeat at the hands of the Air Scottish Eagles, but things would change. This was a new Northern Ireland, a hopeful place in the times after the Belfast Agreement or Good Friday Agreement, this was an exciting new game for the people of Ulster, only it wasn't. Ice hockey had been around in Northern Ireland for a long time. Dedicated followers of the game will know of teams such as the Castle Ray Knights and the North End Racers. But for many, the thrill of watching the Giants take to the ice was something exciting and new. To trace the origins of the sport in Northern Ireland, we are going much further back, back beyond the millennium, beyond the troubles, to a time of global conflict to 1939. Field hockey had long been a popular pastime in the United Kingdom, in Ireland and across the globe. In the streets of Belfast, the sectarian violence of the 1920s had largely dissipated, although tensions still ran high at times. Newsreels and old papers spoke of the likelihood of an upcoming war, but for most in Northern Ireland, there was little concern Diarists from the time wrote of peace and tranquility of the carefree way of life. There was a belief that the war was something that would happen elsewhere. Why would the Nazis have any interest in Ulster? And so in neighbourhoods across Belfast, children played happily in the streets. Of course, they played football or soccer. They played traditional street games like hopscotch, but a newer craze was developing too, a fast-paced fun game called roller hockey. Streets in working class areas of East Belfast and North Belfast, streets that would in a few years face the devastation of falling Luftwaffe bombs, resounded to shouts and cheers as local children skated and slotted home goals between makeshift posts. As the sport's popularity grew, so too did the opportunity to play, and informal competitions took place at sporting venues like Dunmore Park off the Antrim Road and in community halls such as the Palm Hall on East Belfast's Tamar Street. Across the Irish Sea, predominantly in London, ice hockey was fast growing in popularity. Were it to become a sport in Northern Ireland, a dedicated venue would be required. In June 1933, work began on the construction of the King's Hall. This large indoor arena owned by the Royal Ulster, Ulster Agricultural Society would become a famous attraction in South Belfast home to the Balmoral Show and host to legendary concerts from the likes of the Beatles and Nirvana. The hall opened on the 29th of May 1934 at a cost of £61,139. By 1938, ice hockey was a pop culture phenomenon. In December that year, you could head down to the Curzon Cinema on Belfast's Ormer Road to watch Icy Ice, a tale of an inventor who creates a camera small enough to conceal in a bow tie. An ice hockey game is taking place and the press is banned. And so our protagonist takes on the role of referee, sneaking his camera into the rink. The star of Icy Ice is none other than George Formby. <laughs> Earlier in the year, crowds at the State Cinema in Ballymena 
had enjoyed Idol of the Crowds, a thrilling love story B-movie set against a hockey rink backdrop starring John Wayne and Sheila Bromley. Other movies that year included The Game That Kills, a drama of ice hockey, dodgy dealings and racketeering. Boy, oh boy, is this a hockey game tonight, folks. The Blues are giving the favorite Indians plenty of trouble. The Blues are launching another attack. There they go. They're through the Indians' defense, and it looks like a goal for the Blues. Johnson's about to shoot. He does. Oh, oh, oh. Loose the Indian goalie just pulled a beautiful save. Something's wrong with the Indians tonight, folks. They're off their game. They're not playing with that usual punch. They're heavy favorites tonight, but here they are out there struggling to hold their own. Joe Holland, the coach for the Indians, looks funny worried, and he should be. Unless his team snaps up, but they'll never get into the playoffs. There they go. The Blues are on another raid. Mm, what a freak, folks. An Indian just stole the puck. It's number seven, Tommy Ferguson, that flashy left winger. He's the only one on the team that's in form tonight. It's a sure goal. No, miss. Drake and Adams is coming up fast from both sides. They're going to support Ferguson. Look out. Boy, what a steal. In June 1938, questions were being asked in the letters pages of the North Down Herald and County Down Independent newspaper. Much like recording a podcast episode about ice hockey at the height of summertime, the short piece came under the headline, Out of Season. It reads, This idea may be out of season, but it is one worthy of consideration. It concerns the Canadian sport, ice hockey, which is booming on the other side of the channel, both in England and Scotland. While this may or may not be the time of year to consider winter sports, it is generally reckoned that, well, the early bird. There is no doubt that the sport has caught on tremendously across the water and is undoubtedly one which could more than pay its way here. Ice rinks costing about £20,000 to £30,000 are springing up like mushrooms, and £20,000 is not such a large sum when spread over, say, 1,000 shareholders. Surely there would be sufficient support coming from Belfast to justify the erection of one either in the city or in Bangor, preferably the former place. Ireland has never been exploited for ice sports, and yet it can surely boast a large quota of skaters in the population. The ice hockey teams are, of course, recruited from Canada, so there won't be any question of going outside the empire. Curling clubs could be formed, and this is a grand old sport for active old men and enthusiastic young ones. Skating is definitely on the upgrade, as would soon be proved by the erection of a sports centre. The idea is perhaps unseasonable, but it has its possibilities. Unseasonable it may have been, but the case stood, and little over a year later, on the 4th of October 1939, the Belfast Ice Rink opened to the public at Belfast's King's Hall. Local newspapers reported that over a thousand skaters besieged the building on its opening night. John Gaston was the managing director of the company who leased and operated the rink. He was also the owner and ran the aforementioned Curzon Cinema. Gaston brought much in the way of local business acumen, but he needed someone who understood the ins and outs of a rink, and that man would be Arnold Duke Brockman. Duke was a Canadian ice hockey player and coach, and in his role as manager of the Belfast Ice Rink, hockey was about to become big business in the city. Brockman was a real pioneer of the sport. As a former player, he continued to coach, to train teams, to referee games, and become an ambassador and promoter of the game. The latter half of 1939 saw Britain declare war on Germany, saw the British Expeditionary Force set off for France. But meanwhile, in Northern Ireland, the ice hockey business was really gaining traction. On the 18th of July 1939, the British Ice Hockey Association issued a statement to expand the sport to all regions of the United Kingdom. It read, As the body internationally recognised and responsible for the control of ice hockey in Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and in view of the recent expansion of the sport, the BIHA have decided that as from August 1st, 1939, the following provision shall take effect. 
In accordance with the regulation and statutes of the international controlling body, Ligue Internationale d'Hockey sur Glace, all ice hockey clubs in Great Britain and Northern Ireland must be affiliated direct to the British Ice Hockey Association, and the individual players must hold valid BIHA playing certificate. With rules and regulations in place and Duke Brockman at the helm, Belfast was set. But on the subject of rules, this was a new sport for the people of Northern Ireland. In advance of the first games taking place in Belfast, several newspapers ran articles that described the intricacies of the game. Let's have a look at the rules of the game as laid out by the Belfast Telegraph on the 30th of November 1939. Many people will be patronising their first ice hockey match to be played in Belfast at the King's Hall Balmoral on Saturday next and will enjoy the game much better if they know something of the rules. It is generally recognised as the fastest and toughest game in the world. Hard knocks are given and taken and occasionally players have stitches inserted returning to the ice to continue the game. The rink is divided into three zones, neutral, attacking and defence and the game lasts for three periods of 20 minutes each. The goals are about 10 feet wide and two feet deep, and the player in goal is known as the goal minder. Six players for each team are on the ice at once, and the formation is goal minder, two defensemen, and three forwards. The teams carry substitutes, usually three, but they can only replace players when the whistle has blown for a foul or an infringement of the rules. If a foul is serious, a player can be sent to the box for one to five minutes, according to the seriousness of the offence. And the penalty box is an enclosure at the side of the rink, and an official with a stopwatch times the period of detention. The sticks are somewhat similar to hockey sticks, have longer handles, and the blade is flat and used on both sides. The rubber puck, four inches in diameter, can be driven with terrific force. And so... The people of Belfast were ready. Someone at the King's Hall was preparing to holler, let's play hockey. On the 2nd of December 1939, the Royal Air Force was preparing to drop its first bomb on German-occupied land in Europe. Across the Atlantic, the Roosevelt administration had imposed a moral embargo on the Soviet Union, encouraging American companies not to sell airplanes, vehicles or components to Stalin. In Northern Ireland, however, Excitement was building for Belfast's first taste of live ice hockey. Exactly 61 years to the day before the Belfast Giants skated out in the Odyssey Arena, two London teams, that's London, England, not London, Ontario, took to the ice at the King's Hall. The opening game at 2pm saw a thrilling 8-6 scoreline at the, as the Wembley Colts ran out victorious over rivals of the Wembley Terriers. Another newspaper article from Ireland's Saturday Night provided a little more context for new casual fans. The players look like giants from another age. So well are they padded on shoulders, arms and legs. For this is a real man's game in which the blows given and taken are of the hardest. The goalkeeper is like a robot with his huge cricket pads and wicket keeper's gloves. The second game of the day saw the Wembley Terriers extract revenge with a 7-12 victory. If it was a fast-paced, goal-heavy thriller that Gaston and Brockman wanted to show the excitement of the game to a new audience, then that's exactly what they got. The next series of games was already in the calendar. Two more English teams would visit on the 16th of December 1939, the Marlboros and the Red Wings, both from London's Earl's Court Arena. I don't believe anything in Duke Brockman's plan was accidental, and with the exhibition game drawing to a close, it was time to really garner local interest. It had at times been difficult for new local fans to get behind the visiting English teams. One newspaper reporter quipped that the atmosphere may have come on some had the teams worn blue jerseys and green and white hook jerseys. However, with the Red Wings versus Marlboro's game in the third period, the atmosphere ramped up in the King's Hall. The sports reporter in the Northern Whig on the 18th of December 1939 tells us why. Though the evening game was poorly attended, there was more enthusiasm than at the match between Colts and Terriers a fortnight previously. This was possibly due to the fact that Archie Greer, a local player, came on as a substitute for the Marlboros and incidentally revealed himself as being a much better than a raw hand at the game. 
That article ended with a tempting prospect. Early in the new year, Belfast would have its own team. A local team to take on their English and Scottish counterparts. But there was a war on. Travel restrictions were in place. Crossing the Irish Sea was fraught with danger, and perhaps Gaston and Brockman had a bigger vision the entire time. By the 30th of December 1939, only two weeks after that last exhibition game, Ireland Saturday Night was reporting on the establishment not of a Belfast team, but a Belfast league. Four teams, the Harlandic Wolves, the Balmoral Tigers, the Short and Harland Raiders and the Thornton Wasps would battle it out throughout 1940 in both the Belfast House League and the Gaston Cup. A reporter writing under the nom de plume, the Skater, fills us in on the key stats. The organisation of the Belfast Hockey League is rapidly working to a successful conclusion. At a full dress practice match last week, an exciting game took place at the King's Hall between Thorntons and Short and Harlands. At the end of an exciting and even struggle, the result was a draw of one goal each. It is hoped to stage the first public league game before the end of January. The King's Hall team is naturally setting the pace. They have some extremely promising talent available. Archie Greer, who made a promising debut in Belfast when assisting the Earl's Court Marlboros, will be one of the forward line. His two brilliant individual goals scored against the Red Wings should prove a good augury of goals to come. His Marlborough performance was all the more creditable when it was remembered that, Th that Thompson, one of the Red Wings defencemen whom he was up against, has played for England 32 times in international games. Nick McLaughlin's nickname of Trian will give you some idea of his speed, while Donald McIntyre, a very young player only 14 years of age, is a prodigy for his years. Johnny Chivers is another useful stickman. Henrik Kaskar, a Czech by nationality, is also among the probables. He has been away from his native land for three years and seems quite acclimatised, but his countryman, Don Morovich, has been in Belfast only eight months and is a refugee. Ernie Johnson is available as a, as a goalminder. This experienced player belonged to the same team as, in Canada as Arnold Brockman, the coach. Another experienced player who may find a place in the Kings Hall team is Zinnett, an Austrian who played for Zentral Verein in Vienna. Although there are a number of strangers, however, the great majority of players are Belfast born and bred and are fully capable of holding their own with the rest. Aiming for an end of January start to the hockey season may have seemed ambitious, but Duke Brockman was a driven man. And such was the wave of enthusiasm within the city that the league did start only a few days late of that prediction when Balmoral Tigers faced off against Short and Harland Raiders on the 3rd of February 1940. That day, Flight Lieutenant Peter Townsend of RAF 43 Squadron shot down a Hankel over England, bringing down the first German plane on British soil in the Second World War. Across the Irish Sea in Belfast, the only Raiders on anyone's mind were the team from Short and Harland Aircraft Factory. It was the factory men and their neighbours in Queen's Island, the Harland and Wolf Shipyard, that provided half the teams and a lot of the energy behind the Belfast League. Six decades later, it would be a team based on Queen's Island, with another Canadian in Dave Whistle at the helm, that would reintroduce big game night hockey to a whole new generation of fans. Remember when that newspaper and article in 1940 said that the players looked like giants from another age. But Dave Whistle was not the only Canadian to make his mark with the Belfast Giants, nor was he the only Whistle. From 2016 to 2018 and returning in 2021, Dave's son Jackson Whistle has become a firm fan favourite in the SSE arena. Young Whistle was not the first British Canadian to make his mark in a Belfast hockey team, and nor was he the first named Jackson. On Friday, the 4th of June, 1943, a coup d'etat in Argentina ousted President Ramon Castillo. Henri Giroud became Commander-in-Chief of the French Free Forces in Europe, and the Royal Navy sank a U-308 off the coast of Norway. And in a small terraced house at 13 Hollycroft Avenue in East Belfast, a young man died. He was 21 years old. His cause of death was secondary anemia due to Hodgkin's disease. That young man was Jackson Kennedy, ice hockey star and former captain of the Harlandic Wolves.
Born on Boxing Day, 26th of December, 1921, Robert Jackson Kennedy was the eldest son of Robert Kennedy and Margaret Kennedy, Nee Buchanan of 75 Umeath Street, Belfast. Like many with an Ulster Scots heritage, he was known by his middle name, and as a young man, Jackson and the family emigrated to Canada. On the 30th of May, 1930, Jackson's name appears alongside his mother and younger brother, Ernest Thompson Kennedy, on the passenger list of SS Doric. Travelling on a special emigrant rate, their third-class passengers departing Belfast and set to arrive in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, on the 8th of June, 1930. The family had by this time already spent some time in Canada between September 1927 and April 1929. Robert Kennedy was by this time a resident at 363 6th Avenue, Verdun, Montreal. He was an iron turner and had followed his brother Hugh Kennedy to Quebec in 1926. By 1940, however, Jackson, aged 18 years old, had returned to Belfast, where he found employment as a commercial traveller. He also found fame on the ice at the King's Hall, being one of the first players to take to the new rink on its opening. From the first days of the game in Ulster, Jackson Kennedy stood out. He was one of only a handful of players with experience playing in Canada, and it showed. Towards the end of that inaugural season, Jackson Kennedy and another player who learned the game in Canada, Archie Greer, were top goal scorers, having found the net nine times each. Not to be outdone, Jackson would notch up a further three goals in the first match of the Gaston Cup final on the 22nd of May 1940. As captain of the league and cup-winning Harlandic Wolves, he lifted the Gaston Cup from Miss Marjorie Webster on the 29th of May, 1940. Following his tragic and untimely death, Jackson Kennedy was buried in Dundonald Cemetery on the outskirts of East Belfast, only a few hundred yards away from the ice bowl rink where generations of new young hockey players have learned the trade over the years. Less is known about Archie Greer, Kennedy's teammate at the Harlandic Wolves. By the midway point of the season, both Greer and Kennedy were tied on nine goals apiece. Greer's goals, however, came split between two teams. He started the season with Balmoral Tigers, the home team of the Belfast Ice Rink, before a shock transfer in April 1940 to the Harlandic Wolves. If you remember, it was Archie Greer who whipped crowds into a frenzy during the Marlboros versus Red Wings exhibition. Born on the 8th of October 1920, Archie was the eldest son of Alexander Greer and Anne Jane or Annie Greer, née Adams. On the 21st of May 1921, the three members of the Greer family arrived in Canada, bound for the town of Stuartburn in Manitoba. Alexander was a farm labourer and moved around Canada over the next two decades. Young Archie had siblings born in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Essex, Ontario and Windsor, Ontario. And then, in 1939, the world changed. Alexander and Annie Greer, now with seven children in tow, returned to Belfast, where Alexander joined the Merchant Navy. He served as a greaser on vessels including HMS Carnarvon Castle until his time of death aged 44 years old on the 2nd of February 1941. His grave is in Dido Valley Cemetery in Simonstown, South Africa. And this was not the last tragedy to befall the Greer family in 1941. Soon after the family returned to Belfast, Annie gave birth to another daughter, Sylvia June Greer. On the night of 15th to 16th of April 1941, the Luftwaffe attacked Belfast in what became known as the Easter Raid of the Belfast Blitz. Young Sylvia June Greer, Archie's youngest sister, died as a result of the bombing, along with hundreds more residents of the city. By this time, Archie had followed in his father's footsteps, joining the Merchant Navy. The escalation of the Second World War across Europe eventually brought a temporary end to ice hockey in Belfast. In December 1940, the victorious Harlandic Wolves held their annual end-of-year dinner dance in Thompson's Restaurant in Belfast. While the mood was celebratory for the most part, there was also a sense of intrepidation. The King's Hall venue had been requisitioned for the war effort. The Air Ministry acquired the site in late 1940, converting the hall into an aircraft factory for use by Short and Harland, who produced fuselages for Stirling bombers there until 1945. 
Production of the short and Harland aircraft factory increased, so too did manufacturing of vessels for the Royal Navy and Merchant Navy from the Harland and Wolf shipyard. At that dinner dance in December 1940, the Harlandic Wolves resolved to keep the team together for the duration of the conflict and make contributions to war charities and other good causes. The hall was derequisitioned in December 1945, and after some repairs to the flooring, Ice hockey returned in early 1947. Of the original four teams, only Harlandic Wolves returned to the ice, although Balmoral and Shorts would ice different teams in future competitions. Many of those who played in 1940 would go on to play a role in developing the game in the post-war years. And in the decades that followed, ice hockey continued in peaks and troughs in Belfast. Many teams have come and gone, paving the way for the Belfast Giants, who are currently icing one of their most successful squads. With the establishment of the franchise in the year 2000, there was a desire for ice hockey to remain a neutral, safe space, free from the trappings of sectarianism that dogged many other sports, teams and grounds over the years. Even in 1940, there were questions over what side ice hockey was on. Remember the reporter who suggested the atmosphere would be greater should the teams wear the colours of Glasgow Rangers and Glasgow Celtic, or perhaps more fittingly, Linfield Football Club and Belfast Celtic, two local sides at the height of their game at the time. Some supposed ice hockey to be a game for the Protestant, Unionist or Loyalist population of the city. The historical links between Ulster and Canada hinted at links with the British Empire. Many of those who emigrated, travelling back and forth across the Atlantic, were of Ulster Scots heritage, bringing that culture to Canada, where Presbyterian churches and Orange Order lodges became more common. In 1940, two of the major teams were formed in the shipyard and the nearby aircraft factory, two large local firms with predominantly working-class Protestant workforce, while the rink itself was situated in an affluent part of the south of the city. The assertion that ice hockey was a game for Protestant people was not helped by the playing of God Save the King after each game and skating session. However, there was never any bar to uh, those who could play the sport. In this short episode alone, we've seen people from across the United Kingdom, from Canada, local men and boys who identified as either British or Irish, and some who were refugees fleeing the building horrors in 1930s Europe. For more than 80 years now, ice hockey has remained a sport that can be enjoyed by families from all walks of life in Northern Ireland. The world is a vastly different place now than it was in 1939 when the skates of the Colts and Terriers first graced the ice in Belfast. Hockey is a bigger business in the city than it's ever been, and I'd like to think that the likes of Archie Greer, Jackson Kennedy, and particularly the ambitious Canadian Duke Brockman, would be thrilled to see crowds spill out of the SSE Arena on Queen's Island, where the domestic trophy cabinet is currently filled with silverware. From wartime to peace, from giants of a different age to, well, just the giants. Subscribe to A Wee Bit of War on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favourite shows. That way, you'll never miss an episode. Tell your friends, tell your family, Tell your co-workers, break all the rules of the Official Secrets Act, and why not leave us a review to help others find the podcast. Thank you for joining me on the ice, and I look forward to your company next time for another wee bit of war.